Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, Park Avenue Church family. I just covered all the bases, I hope, and others who may be joining our service online here today. We welcome you. Uh, let's just bow our heads and pray to open our service. God and our Father, we just come into your holy presence. We want to thank you afresh for your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Father, we thank you for this day set aside that we can gather in some form or another to worship you and to honor you. And our Father, we just uh, pray as we sing some hymns together and, and our Father, we just pray that we will hear from your word later on from Pastor Joe. And our Father, we just uh, want to bring honor and glory to your name. So we commit ourselves into your care. In his name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Park Avenue this morning. We're so happy that you're worshiping with us. Um, please stand to your feet. And um, we just want to give a shout out to all the moms out there today. Happy Mother's Day. Please sing with us. There is mercy in the Take it. 
This next song we're going to sing for you is called Love Like This by Lauren Daigle. It's, it's one of my, um, it's just a really favorite song that, that came up this week on my ride to work. Um, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like the lyrics in this song. I feel like I'm very unworthy and undeserving of God's love. Um, I feel like a wasteland, and God is the water. And I feel like winter, and he is the fire. And I feel like a long night, and tired, and weary, and he is my sunrise. And he is just, he sustains me. He gives me the strength I need to, to get through the day. Um, he's my joy, and, and the love that he has for me. I'm just so unworthy and undeserving of that love. And I hope this song, I hope it can speak to your heart today.
morning, everyone. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, this morning for our Bible reading time, rather than reflecting back on the plan that we've been reading, I'd like to take a break from that and have us meditate on the Lord and on our moms because it's Mother's Day. In Genesis 127, we read that God created men and women in his own image and that everything that we have that is good comes from him. So if you could spend some time reflecting on the amazing person that your mom was or is to you, and, uh, and then also lining those good things up with the source of those good things in God, I think that'd be a really great uh, exercise for us both to respond to God's goodness in our lives and to thank our moms for being the people that he made them to be. Uh, we know that uh, that everything good comes from God and that all the good things that our mom was or is to us came from him. So we can use it as a time to encourage our mothers and to respond to the Lord together. So take some time as a group to discuss those things and then pray and thank the Lord for who he is and who he made our moms to be. Hello again. This week, Pastor Joe is continuing on in 1 John 3 about God's love and how God's love can be shown in our own lives. From a human perspective, we can't even begin to understand the magnitude of God's love. I often think of the words of this old hymn, The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. Verse 2 goes on to say, Could we with think the ocean fill? And were the skies a parchment made, were every stock on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above, would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. In 1 John 3 and 23 we read these words, And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave his commandment. And it goes on to say in, in chapter 4 and uh, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another. And drop down to verse 11, Beloved, if God so loves us, we ought to also love one another. We have a commandment from Christ in these verses that we should love one another. It's not an easy task as some of us can be very difficult to love. In the Old Testament times, the law of Moses demanded love. But we now have the Holy Spirit in us and have a renewed heart. Let us seek to be obedient to his command and show his divine love to each other. Thank you for listening and have a great week. Hi everyone. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Uh, we're so blessed that our church is blessed with so many amazing mothers. And I, I hope that you have been blessed today, that you've been pampered a little bit. And thank you so much for the role you play in our church and the role you play in our families. Um, I'd like to, to pray as we start our message today. Lord, uh, yeah, I thank you for, for the moms and for how you've blessed us with them. I pray that you would bless them today. And Lord, as we dive into your word, may um, we be challenged and encouraged of who you are and and may you help us to respond in love and obedience amen now uh i don't know how many of you have ever watched or seen the show called undercover boss but it's, it's a pretty cool show uh the, the the basic premise is is that every week there's a ceo who goes undercover in his own company and so he'll go and to different uh, locations and, and kind of be the grunt for a day. And so every day he goes to a different spot and kind of learns the ropes. And, and his goal is to, to learn about the company. What do people see? How are, uh, see it from a, a di different and fresh perspective. And, and usually at the end of the week, he'll reveal who he is to all the people that he's met. And most of the time he'll give them gifts uh, just thanking them for w all that they do, and uh, it's pretty cool. But o occasionally, there's <laughs> some people who aren't quite that aren't aren't that great. And one of the one of the examples that I found was there's there is a CEO uh, of a place in the states called uh, Boston Market, and the CEO is like walking around with this manager, and 
he's telling her what, what to do. And he tells her this. He says, I literally hate customers more than anything in the entire world. I hate them so much. So she has to take him aside and kind of let him go because you're working, your job is to serve and help customers. You can't do that if you hate them. And so you're completely at odds with our, <laughs> with our values. And so you can go home now. Um, and it's pretty, it's pretty entertaining because sometimes you'll see some of these people who are not very nice people and other times there are these people who have these amazing hearts who who work tirelessly um, to serve others to do a good job because they love what they do they love the company and they just want to do the, the best that they possibly can and so yeah some people their love for their job and their love for others and their love for their boss clearly radiates out of them. And for some people, not so much. So with that in mind, let's look at our passage today. Uh, we're going to read 1 John 3, 16 to 24. Um, Phil, I know Phil ended last week on verse 16, but we're going to pick up on verse 16 as well because it's it ends that other section, but also kind of springboards us into this next section. And um, so let's start by reading verses 16 to 18. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and beholds his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us love not with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. Now, last week we talked about loving one another, and today we're going to talk more about loving one another. Um, and just like we saw last week, um, verse 16 reminds us of what it, that looks like, what it looks like to love each other. Just like Jesus laid down his life for us, we should also lay down our lives for each other. Now, sometimes, at least for me, when I, when I hear that, you can just think of, oh, that means that I should be willing to um, put my life on the line for other people. And I think that's definitely part of it, but it's way more than just that. Like we saw last week, it means sacrificing f for each other, being willing to sacrifice, being willing to move the focus from me to other people. Jesus came to the earth. Uh, he took the form of a man and walked among us. He laid down his privilege and served us, an unworthy people. And so we are called to that same example of loving, self-giving service and care towards each other. We're called to love like him. So then, John gives us an example of what that might look like in verse 17. And I'll, so I'll, I'll call and paraphrase it here. He says, if a Christian has the world's goods, if a Christian has money, if he has possessions, and he recognizes a brother or sister in Christ that's in need, then instead of helping him, he reasons away Oh, why he shouldn't really help them right now, gives lots of excuses, or, or he puts off helping them. He, he shoves down the feelings of compassion and love and just goes on his merry way, doesn't help them out. How is it possible that the love of God lives in them? It's not. John is saying that if we have the means to help a brother or sister out and we don't do it, we can't claim that, one, we have genuine love for God, that we love God. You can't say that. And you also can't claim that God's love lives in you, that it finds a home inside of you. Now, it seems like a pretty harsh way to start a Mother's Day sermon, start off with a bang. But it, if this is really important, right? We live in such an individualistic culture. And for the most part, we just keep to ourselves and... Other people's problems are just that, other people's problems. And most of us probably, we, we don't really take the time to notice the needs of the people around us because we're fo so focused on our own needs and our own wants. And I think that goes to show how far removed that we are from the heart that God has called us, the heart of love that is supposed to be at the core of the church. 
I know that for myself, loving other people is something that uh, kind of seems like something, oh, I should, I really need to do this. Not something that is seen, <laughs> that I see as at the core of what it means to, to, to serve God. <laughs> but I'm reminded of what he's, Jesus or John says in, in John 13, 35, that the world would know that we're Christians by the way that we love each other. That's why I think that it's so good that we are talking about this over and over and over again, because it's so incredibly important, and we can't miss it. That's why I think it's so good, because I think it maybe shows us where our hearts are really at. If we're in a habit of closing our hearts to others, it might be a good indication that maybe we're not really abiding in God like we think we are. So before we continue, why don't we take a little bit to talk about that. How do you feel about the love, about love of God being tied to how we love each other? And what are some ways that, others, that other believers have shown you love in the last few months? Because it's important that we, all, not, not just, oh, we need to do better, but that we recognize that, no, people do do this. And, and we, we encourage each other to do this more. Another important thing to mention is that this passage very much echoes the command uh, that God gave the Israelites in Deuteronomy 15, verse 7 to 11. So I'm going to read that because I think it's important and it helps us understand this passage. So Deuteronomy 15 Verses 7 to 11. If among you one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. Take care lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart and you say, the seventh year, the year of release is near, and you your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother, and you give him nothing. And he cried to the Lord against you, and you be guilty of sin. You shall give to him freely, and your heart shall be and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him, because for this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all you undertake. For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. So, here in the Old Testament, God commanded the Israelites to be generous with each other. They are supposed to not do it grudgingly, they're supposed to, be, to joyfully give and to resist reasons why they may, maybe they shouldn't be generous to them right now. Right? The example they give is every seven years, the Israelites were supposed to, to forgive the debts of everyone. And so, right, if it's late in, in year six and you, you're you see a brother in need and you, you think, maybe I should lend him some money. I'm going to give him a couple thousand dollars to help him out. But it's the sixth year. I'm not going to see any of that back. Well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just wait or maybe I'll do it later, not do it. Right? You're not supposed to, to wait. You're supposed to give freely and joyfully to anyone you see in need. doesn't matter if it'll cost you. You're not to close your heart towards each other. Like it says here in First John they're supposed to be generous with each other and trust that the Lord will be generous with them as they do so. So we might be thinking, I need to, to tell other people that I love them, or even better, I need to, to show other people that I love them, to do things for them. But John tells us that we, we must not love one another with word or with tongue. And so seeing that we can't just tell each other that we love them or, or go on nice long-winded speeches on how amazing and wonderful other people are. We are to love one another in deed and in truth. So in, in deed, meaning that we don't just say we love each other, we actually back that up with actions. So you, you don't just tell people, man, I really hope things work out for you. You actually do things to help them. But that's not all we're supposed to do. We're also supposed to love each other in truth. And now when I first read that, I had no clue what that meant. I thought, well, maybe 
Does that mean we're supposed to tell each other the truth even when it's tough? And I think yes, but I don't think that's what it's talking about here. I think what he's talking about is that the, the actions, the deeds that we do, we actually have to mean them. They actually have to come from a heart of love. We need to be, uh, we need to love through truthful deeds, through genuine deeds. We can't just say the right things. We can't even just do the right things. They have to come from a heart of love, a heart that loves God and the heart that loves others. They have to be genuine. Otherwise, they don't work. We need to show the truth that is in us through our actions. Now let's read verses 19 to 20. It says, We shall know by this that we are of the truth and shall assure our heart before him. And whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So, first when I read this section, I thought it was pretty straightforward, and I started studying it and realized maybe it's not as straightforward as I thought it would be. So, hopefully I can uh, explain this section in a way that is is clear and makes sense um, for the rest of it. So, first, he says, we will know by this that we are of the truth. So, we'll know by how we love one another that we are of the truth. We'll know how we love each other helps us know that we know God. And specifically, what he's addressing here again is helping others who are in need, helping other Christians, loving them. And so that makes sense. Our actions reassure us that there is an inward transformation in us. So the next part says, and will assure our hearts before him in whatever our hearts condemn us. So some translations will split this sentence into two different sentences. Some will put it together. And the sentence isn't super clear, right? What are we being assured of? What does it mean for our hearts to condemn us? Who or what is doing the assuring? And different translations will use different words for uh, this word assurance. Uh, The NLT says, so that we will be confident. ESV says, reassure. NIV says, set our hearts at rest. And now, almost every other place, this word means to convince or persuade. And nowhere else does it carry a meaning similar to comfort. That's what the word means, is to persuade or convince along those lines. Now, I know preachers can sound really snobby when they that we talk about, well, actually, the Greek meaning of this word is, um, but, but stick with me because I, I think this actually really helps us understand this passage. So using the, word, uh, the meaning of convince and persuade, we know it would go something like this. We know how we, how we love each other. Sorry. We know by how we love each other that we are of the truth, that we follow God and we persuade our hearts whenever our hearts condemn us. But what does it mean for our hearts to condemn us? So again, we look back and we see hearts are mentioned just a few verses before. And John says, if we close our hearts towards others, towards those in need, how can God's love be in us? So when our hearts do that, when our hearts desire is not to show love to others, to close ourselves off from them and just to care for ourselves we're, we're supposed to convince our hearts before God, to remind ourselves of who we're following, to remind ourselves of why we love others, why we love God, and who we serve. Convince our hearts to love others when our hearts don't want to. And I think that this is really encouraging for me because I don't always feel like loving other people. And sometimes it will well up and, and come out of me, and other times... I have to work at it. I have to remind myself, remind my heart of who the God is that I serve. And I find that really encouraging because sometimes you just feel like it should just be super easy. It should just flow out of me. And yes, it will sometimes. But there are times where it will take work and that's okay. God has told us that it will take work and we need to put in the effort when, when, it, when it does take work. And, and that's kind of what he says right here afterwards. In verse 20, right, he says, the reason why is we do this is because God is greater than our hearts and he knows all things. Meaning that John is reminding us that God's heart is pure and perfect, unlike ours. 
He does not close his heart off to the needy, the broken, or the marginalized. God is compassionate and he is generous. And that's why we need to love. That's why we need to resist our heart's sinful desires because God's heart for us. John also reminds us that God knows all things. God notices everything. He sees when we take the opportunity to love others and he sees when we don't and harden our hearts and ignore the needs of those around us. He sees it all. So before we move on, what do you think of the idea of persuading your heart? And how would you go about doing that? Let's continue and read verse 21. It reads, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. So if our heart does not condemn us, meaning that we are in fact responding to the calls to generously provide for fellow believers. We are loving each other. We are not hardening our heart. We don't have hearts that would condemn us before God. Then we experience confidence in front of him. And, and confidence is not cockiness here. We don't have confidence before him because, man, I'm all that. I'm doing all the good stuff. No, that's not why we have confidence. We have confidence because we're secure in God. We're secure in him. We are walking in his grace and in his mercy. We're confident in him, not in ourselves. And we're confident because we're close to him. And so now I know we, we just had a question, but I think it's beneficial for us to discuss this as well. What do you think that confidence before God looks like? And how often would you say that you have confidence before God and why? Now let's read verse 22. It reads, And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Now, if we read the first half of that verse out of context, it can sound pretty sweet, right? Almost like we can ask God for absolutely anything and he'll give it to us. That's not what it says, <laughs> especially because we didn't see the second half of this verse. Right? The reason why we receive whatever we ask of God is because we're keeping his commandments. We do what pleases him. And what are his commandments? Let's read verse 23. And his commandment, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. So we believe in the name of Jesus, and when we say we believe in the name of Jesus, that means we believe in him. The name represents the person. We believe in him and all that he is. So we believe and trust in Jesus, our Savior, the divine Son of God, the sinless one, the Messiah. And we love each other. Now notice that both of these are in present tense, meaning that you have to keep doing them. It's not enough to say, oh yeah, I believed in Jesus way back when, so I'm good now. Or I did a really nice act of service for a Christian way back when. So yeah, I love, I, I have loved others. It's not just a matter of I did it way back when. We need to keep and continually love put our trust in God, and also continually love one another. It made me think of, of that, the stereotypical husband when his wife tells him, you never tell me you love me. And he goes, well, I, I told you I loved you when I married you, didn't I? I'll let you know if I ever changed my mind. Right? We, can't, we can't have that attitude in our walk with God. You shouldn't have that in marriage, really. We should be constantly telling our wives that we love them. But especially in our walks with God, we can't just rely on an act of love way back when. We need to be continually walking in love with him, in love with each other. And these are not options. They're commands. And it says it right here. And so it's no wonder that if we're walking in obedience to God here, uh, walking in obedience to his commands, trusting him, loving him, that when we pray, that God would answer us and, and give us what we're, we've asked for because we're loving him. 
or serving him. We want what he wants. We want what he desires. And so our prayers are are aligned according to his will. And so of course, he's going to give us what we've asked for because we've, we're asking uh, for his glory, for his purposes. Now, let's look at verse 24. It says, And the one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And we know by this that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. So, when we hear about how God is commanding us to love it, one another. <clears throat> it, and if we don't, how can God's love be in us? It can seem a little bit overwhelming and kind of like we're being condemned. Like we need to shape up and do better or else. But I want to remind us that we shouldn't follow God out of uh, a need, out of a sense of duty, out of a sense of, of a chore that we need to tick off these boxes or else God's going to be mad at us. And that's why verse 24 here is so important. Because John reminds us that if we keep God's commandments, that we abide in him and God abides in us. Following God's commandment isn't just a matter of try harder, do more. If we want to honor and follow God, we have to abide in him and he will abide in us. Obedience isn't just a request or a command to try harder. It's an invitation to abide deep, more deeply. Please don't take away from this message that you just need to try harder to love the people around you, and if you don't want to, too bad, just try harder. If that's what we take, we're going to become a bunch of bitter and angry people. The point of what John is saying here is that we need to draw closer to God. We need to love others because of his love in us. We persuade our hearts when we don't feel like loving others because we love God and because he loves us. We obey his commands because we love him. This is not a message to just go out and try harder to love other people. It's a message, it's a reminder to draw nearer to your Savior. And so how do we know that the God of the universe abides in us? He says, by the spirit that he has given us. Right? The Holy Spirit lives in us. And now this verse is, is a transition to the next one as well. And so Phil is going to talk about more about the Holy Spirit and, and spirits too in general um, and flesh this idea out a little more. But um, John has just finished talking about how we need to be obeying God and how we need to be living righteously and how we need to reflect his character. And all that is evidence that the Holy Spirit is at work in us. It's outward evidence that he is in us. But that's, we know, it's, not, it's not only through outward actions that we know that he abides in us. Romans 8.28 tells us that the Holy Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are children of God. The Holy Spirit testifies, speaks to us, to our souls, and reminds us and tells us that we are his children, that we are in him. God reassures us. So not only does the Holy Spirit empower us to follow and obey him, but reassures him and comforts us that we are in him. We both have outward and inward reassurance. <clears throat> now, mothers, don't think I, that I've forgotten about you or that it is Mother's Day. When I first looked at this passage, I immediately, it was clear to me how this passage obviously relates to mothers. Because moms, you have <laughs> the call to love your families every day, 24 seven. And you're often asked to put the needs of others in front of you, um, even when we are, your families are being difficult, you, you, you need to choose not to harden your hearts and to continue to love and serve us. And now, you, you aren't perfect at this, but I know for many of us, what we've been talking this last little while of loving one another, serving sacrificially, you moms have been a really great example in our lives of what that actually looks like. I know that mothers often spend countless nights without sleep 
caring for their kids. They serve their families in far more ways than they even realize, and in ways that often go unthanked. Thank you for the example of loving service. And moms, we know that your ability to love others, to love your families, is a gift from God. And so I just wanted to share briefly of how um, the moms in my life, how their love for God has been evident in the way that they've loved others. First, Shelby, my wife, um, recently we found out that our youngest is allergic to dairy. And so you've um, readily and willingly given up food that is delicious and yummy, not for your sake, but because you love your son. And that is cool to see your, your attitude and your joy to see how you're, you're ready and willing to give something up because it means uh, someone else uh, gets the benefit. And for my mom, my mama, um, you've always worked so hard to care for us. And there's a ton that I, I could think to thank you of too. But there's two things that came to mind. One of them was that growing up, you often included a little note in our lunchboxes telling us that you loved us and you cared for us and that you were praying for us or reminding us of God's love. And I don't think I ever mentioned anything ever related to those cards, but thank you for just your continued persevering way to, to remind us that you love us and to remind us of God's love for us. It just reminds me so much of, of how God is persistent in telling us of how he loves us. Um, and also, the other thing I thought of is, is growing up, all throughout school, you were insistent on telling their teachers that you cared for them and that you appreciated them and giving them a gift, no matter who it was. Um, sometimes, especially as I got older, it was a little, I thought it was a little embarrassing. Uh, it wasn't really. But it was such a good example to me um, to show love to others, especially when you're a kid in school, you don't always think to, to tell your teacher that you love and appreciate them. And so thank you for providing that example of showing love to others. Um, yeah. And I could talk about so many more things, and especially you go on, there's a lot of other um, moms who have had a deep and profound impact in my life. But thank you all for being amazing examples of the love of Christ. In Park Avenue, hopefully as you reflect on how your mother, the mothers in your life have loved you and been examples of what it looks like to love others, that you're reminded of the love of God. The God who so loved us that he gave his life up for us that we could truly find life. May it be our joy to grow in him, to serve him, and to extend his love to all and to especially to each other. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for how you've loved us and cared for us, and thank you for the moms that you've blessed us with. Lord, help us to abide, to love, to serve you wholeheartedly, and for your love to never depart from us. May we tirelessly work to love each other and may it be an amazing example to each other but especially to our community of the work that you have done in our hearts thank you for the moms again and for their, their tirelessly uh, examples of love amen